Hello and welcome to Catholic Unscripted episode 19. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. I'm Gavin Ashenden. Sorry we haven't been with you for the last couple of weeks. There's a there's a couple of news stories we want to look at today and the first one is about the cancellation of Calvin Robinson which I know Gavin you've written about. So Calvin had planned to um, de- pr- record an Easter message on GB News at Warwick Street Church but the choir members of the choir or one member or many we don't know objected to his coming and then his appearance was cancelled can you tell us about that give us the fuller picture Gavin I can but but actually if everyone who wants to hear wants to hear it in Calvin's own words he was interviewed by Michael Horace just a few days ago um, and it's six minutes towards the end, and he, he he gives the exact picture here. He was asked to go and speak to the young people's group at Warwick Street. There's one at the Oratory as well, which which I've been asked to. I don't think I'll be asked to go to the Warwick Street young people's group, but um, and it went down very well. They loved him, and I think after that, the implication is that uh, he either asked or was invited to have GB, his GB News pre- Easter presentation there. He did a Christmas one at the Oratory, and it was just brilliant. It was. One of the best things on television. Um, I was in it, so I would think that, but it still was anyway. Uh, and the thought that he was going to do an Easter one is really very, very exciting. And I was so pleased it was going to happen at Warwick Street because, you know, although 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 it's slightly tedious when Anglicans borrow Catholic backdrops as they as they do all the time, what's not to like? It gets to promote the, the depth of spirituality that the Catholic Church has. And um, however. Warwick Street has a professional choir. I don't know how many of them are practicing Catholics. I don't know how many of them are heterosexual, bisexual, straight, non-binary, no idea. But they didn't like Calvin and they complained. And so uh, either Father, Father Mark Killis Smith and or the ordinary Monsignor Newton cancelled it. Um, within days, they were about to start shooting. So this was really problematic for GB News professionally uh, and very embarrassing for Calvin. And so when Calvin asked why, he was presented, I mean, there were there were two obvious, well, there was one obvious reason. The obvious reason was Calvin's become very uh, publicly acclaimed for <coughs> his defence of heterosexual marriage. His Oxford Union speech on marriage has got over a half million hits. And I've heard him talk to say somebody that the clips of it have, have gone round and are three or four million. It's just huge. People have been very grateful to have it, to, to have, simply have the facts described. Um... So it would be it would be sensible to think that to put that the choir cancelled him because they they didn't they were not of the marrying kind they were not a heterosexual bastion of appreciation and they found his defence of heterosexual marriage difficult. That would be very alarming if that was the case because if the clergy of Warwick Street had given way to the choir on that matter, they would have essentially have been um, they would have been defending a gay cabal who were insisting upon. Woke, woke the the, uh, the triumph of the woke against Catholic teaching. So they say they didn't do that, which is great. I mean, no one has said they did. We just asked the question and they said they didn't. They instead referred to an article that Calvin written about Enoch Powell. Enoch Powell's notorious. He gets people very twitchy. Uh, this takes us into the whole leftish business of guilt by association. Calvin, I don't think I could write about Enoch Powell because I'm white. But Calvin's black or he's coloured, so he thinks he can. And and why shouldn't he? So he looked at Enoch Powell and immigration. His main point was to say that untrammeled immigration is bad for the church because it, basically it's, it's importing a lot of Islam uh, and diminishing the glue of Christianity in our culture. I think someone's allowed to say that. The clergy of Warwick Street said just the fact that you even got Enoch Powell in a headline which sub-editors say, it's always the subs who do this, the subs give the headlines, as the three of us know from our own Catholic uh, Herald stuff. The subs said, you know, where he not pal is right or something like that. And so the clergy, the clergy cancelled him. So either they cancelled him for political prejudice uh, or they cancelled him for Catholic social teaching. Either way, it's pretty bad. <laughs> and and the reason, it's, so it's bad for Calvin, it's bad manners, it's bad ethics, it's bad integrity. But it's particularly bad because Calvin's doing a very, very good job yeah. about presenting Jesus. And if you're in love with Jesus, you want that to happen. So I was Calvin contacted me and said, I've been cancelled. Would you write about this for me? And I said, Calvin, I can't, because I've I've had a little I've had a little <laughs> excitement with the ordinary at myself. 
And I don't want to be seen to be doing this out of revenge or bad faith. So I'm really sorry, I can't do it. I won't do it. So he went to another journalist, uh, Jules Gomez. Jules did it. He did it very fairly. He phoned up Monsignor Newton. He phoned up Father Mark. He put their quotes in. And um, and I then did write a, 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 an opinion piece on it because it was out there in the public space and I, I had opinions. Interestingly enough, uh, it's gone to nearly 70,000 in, in five days. However, um, I, two responses in the ordinary. I hope Mark will say more about this now. One, um, some of the ordinary clergy said, Oi, stop bashing us. We're precious. We're splendid. We're nice. You don't need to do this to us. Don't be horrid. I've had really quite a number of letters from lay ordinary members saying, We're absolutely disgusted. And we're writing to Monsignor Newton to say so. What does he think he's doing in our name? Uh, Mark, over to you, the bigger picture. Well, I th I've heard from quite a few uh, members of the Ordinariate as well who yeah. have been disappointed by what's happened. And I think that is, you know, it is such a shame. But at the same time, I think it's important to say that, like certainly for lay Catholics, we've felt that the Ordinariate has been a wonderful thing for the church yeah. in, in England, um, you know, and it's... And, has been kind of the seat of orthodoxy. So yep. it is really difficult for me to sort of, um, because I, I I can totally see that this is a, it's like a systemic problem, isn't it? If And it's not something that we just see in the ordinary. It's something that's very prevalent throughout the church. Um, and I think it was summed up very well in uh, Calvin's interview with Boris, where he said that, um, every single bishop in England and Wales had been written to to ask to take part in the debate defending the Catholic understanding of marriage or Christian marriage and no one had the courage to stand up and get involved in that debate. So you had you had this young guy and Dr Ian Paul as well uh, and there was someone else I've done with the other guy was who was uh, who were basically defending marriage against three Anglican men pretending to be bishops. That's right. Was it three Anglican? So, which is just appalling that the that the bishops are doing that. And, yeah. you know, yeah. that, that we haven't really got anyone with any authority who's prepared to stand up and talk about it. But as a very high-ranking member of the clergy said to me some time ago, no one's going to go and hear the gay issue. No, and that, and that is such a sad indictment yeah. that uh, no one has got the courage to actually stand up for what the church teaches. And it makes me feel very, very sad for our, you know, for, for the people who are so confused and don't understand. You know, everyone has got some sort of uh, level of awareness about church teaching on these issues. But our bishops, who are, their office is to teach us, and yet they won't touch this with a barge pole. Mm -hmm. I think what's um, a real shame is what a lost opportunity it, it, it is. And you see this time and again, it's something we saw with the John Fisher scandal last year. If you remember the, the school in South London that uh, invited in a author who declared that he was a homosexual man and he was going to read from a book he had written, which included a, a gay parody of the Lord's Prayer that was really very blasphemous. And for this reason, it was considered inappropriate. It was a safeguarding matter. But well, the narrative... a lot of, it, I think it's important to say it was smutty, wasn't it? It was Catherine? smutty. Like, it if was, it was oh, heterosexual, yeah. you'd have had a problem. It was, exactly. So, yeah. so, that, so that's my point. In other words, in other words, it was it was it was vulgar. If it was heterosexual, it would have been it was it was pornographic. So my point is that he was not uh, cancelled because he was a homosexual man. But this is the narrative that went out and the church stood up and said, no, this author reading this text to young people is inappropriate. And I think the same sort of thing here is happening in in Warwick Street. If they have concerns about something that Calvin has said and they're saying that it's about his um, piece on Enoch Powell, then isn't it possible to have a conversation to, to see what it was that he said? But it's just the shutting down of people there are things that you cannot say and if there's any association at all that's just the end of the conversation that that's really problematic and anyway it's questionable whether it really was about that or something else
but as you say, it's this it's this inability to you would have thought people would be able to to speak about it and say, okay, we think there's a problem here. Let's let's dialogue. But no, it's yeah. as Catholics, you, yeah. you'd hope that we could disagree better, couldn't you? Yes. And that, you know that if there was a problem like that, that perhaps Monsignor Keith would have got everyone together and had yeah. a little conversation or something, tried to work out our differences. I, I, yeah, it doesn't because there's no it's movement. Not very, it's not well done, is it? No. I, I mean, I, I can understand Monsignor Keith's position. I, I mean, I can articulate it for a moment. There's always been a very uneasy relationship between choirs, especially professional choirs, uh, particularly in cathedrals and headquarters of, of, of liturgy, where the choir are relied on to produce exquisite beauty in order to promote the whole cult of sanctity and holiness. And they do it very well. I've got theological questions about what... How, whether beautiful praise has a spiritual currency when it's sung by atheists who are doing it for art's sake. But this is a very complicated metaphysical question and I've been struggling with the whole of my life and I don't want to go there. But I can well understand why at Warwick Street it would have seemed very important to keep the singers on side in order to go on producing a very beautiful mass, of course. But increasingly, I think, and I apologise for saying this in advance, increasingly the parallel for me is of 1930s Germany. Because at the beginning in 1930s Germany, there were all kinds of very good reasons for dealing with immigration, social solidarity, the rebuilding of the German nation, social cohesion, economic renewal. There are all kinds of, of, of reasons for buying in to what the government were doing, all of which were good in themselves or presented as good. But if they were going to go out of control and produce something profoundly destructive to, to Christendom and to democracy. Well, the same thing is happening now. Uh, and and the, what we discovered... You only have to look at the whole um, trans activists aiming to get our children. Mm. We said four or five years ago they'd come for our children. The Chicago Men's Gay Choir said we're coming for your children. Nobody paid any much attention, and, and here they are. There is a, a direct line between the gayification of society and the sexualization of children. So that to the extent that 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 in infant schools, the new regulations about sexual awareness and information require the sexualization of children in a way that most parents would find abhorrent. So this is not an isolated issue. It's part of a joined up yeah. program to destabilize our society, to legitimize sex as, as a form of social currency that's got completely out of control as far as Christians are concerned. And, and my fear is that, that the nice people we live amongst in the church, which including the bishops, are still being fooled into seeing this as, as a matter of the religion of nice and the religion of inclusion. Let us not drive people away who are different or who are struggling. It really isn't anything like that anymore. We're facing a, an, an, an enormously serious ideological assault on Christian anthropology, and the effects of it are immensely corrosive and deeply serious, not just on our children, but on marriages, on the whole concept of marriage. Uh, and even on employment for Christians, you can't have our views and be employed safely. So I think that I understand the dilemma that Father Mark and, and Monsignor Keith were in. I think they made the wrong call. Mm. But having made the wrong call and been invited to be accountable by some of the people to whom they should be accountable, Calvin's owed an apology. Um, and, and my concern is I'm not going after the ordinary act. I love it. I, I hugely respect it. I want to protect it. But it, you need to make an apology when you know you've got things wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah i think that's important isn't it that we remember what the ordinary act is set up for and it, obviously it's something that you in particular would treasure that uh the you know the anglican patrimony or that english catholic patrimony sort of thing of course of so i think you know it, I, I, I said to you before i worry that we sometimes with these things that we end up being a sort of circular firing squad where we're picking on issues but <laughs> that's not to that's not to in any way invalidate you know the facts of this case but um mm. yeah it's difficult yeah. isn't it and to, you know moving so. on Sorry. directly it's the it's the assault on marriage that is the problem mm. and how and one of the things that moved me was how well calvin articulated just the fact that um you know there's a real difference between relationships when the the net result of those relationships is children and when and you know if you're in a relationship a sexual relationship for fun or company if you know whether that's heterosexual or homosexual or whatever 
it's a, it's a very different thing, isn't it? You know, to uh, to the building block, the fundamental building block of society, which is, you know, a heterosexual marriage. And I, you know, I don't see us valuing that, and I don't see us extolling the virtue of that. Um, exactly because, as you say, we're so frightened of, um, you know, up making people feel bad, and that is surely where you're getting to. There is a fracture in our in our thought because we're we're moving away from rational thought and we're moving towards something that's based on feelings all the time. And obviously feelings can be easily manipulated by the enemy. And we have to be aware of that, don't we? I think um I think Calvin's incredibly brave in in what he does and in the way in which he speaks up. Um I was just revisiting Augustine's confessions and I like that he was corresponding with Saint Jerome. And of course it says Saint Augustine corresponded with Saint Jerome, but it, but they were just Augustine and Jerome. They weren't Saint Augustine and Saint Jerome, but they are now. And I think we, we mustn't forget that that is our destiny. That is our calling. That is what we, we were all created for, which is to be saints. And so we hope that we are in a time where we are seeing Saint Calvin and Saint Mark or Gavin or whoever, because it's not far fetched. This is what we're called to do. And that's what we need to remember when we are facing these oppositions and, and asking, should we do what is right or sorry, should we should we do what is nice and inclusive? If it's at the cost of what is right and true, we always have to put truth first. And uh, so the talk of marriage there brings us to the second big story of of the last week or so, which is that the German bishops and delegates voted in favour of providing blessings ecclesiastical blessings to same-sex relationships nine out of 58 opposed the motion 11 abstained and 38 voted in favor of blessing same-sex relationships again gavin i know you've written about this so share that with us i try and put my well i try and put myself in the position of the people who voted for it because for my you know for 10 to 15 years um i would be one of them i i I had a very strong pastoral care for all my gay friends. I lived in Brighton <laughs> and worked worked there. Um, and at the top of my list of hierarchical ethical values was care for the marginalised and the wounded. And that's a perfectly proper Christian uh, ambition. But the problem is, and this is the difficulty that all ethical decision-making requires of us, when we find ourselves dealing with values that are conflicting each other we have to choose one more than the other and the value i think that the german bishops have forgotten and all those who are voting to protect the marginalized have forgotten is that of holiness and so the the, the whole of the old testament is is an exploration in the creation of a people who were being invited to be holy that's that's what it is and it, it it's it's seeped through every aspect of jewish culture and jesus then takes this and deepens it, taking it beyond the cultic and the institutional and the regular into a complete remaking of the heart. Um, and this it's this business of holiness, as to, to move on from what you were saying, Catherine, that seems to escape the present generation. And there's a good reason for that. Um, for the whole of my life, I've been bombarded by um, the neutrality of sexuality. Well, you know, it's just it's just a normative part of chimpanzee human beings perfectly sensible aspiration it's a failure to guard it and safeguard it and corral it uh, has been hidden but but the damage from the sexual revolution in the last 50 years is is is, is, is really terrible and the, the problem is um that that we're having an issue presented to us that caused a great deal of difficulty in the past and that is that the surface language of presentation is really out, out of touch with the root, if you like, the foundational value it represents. And I thought the best way of describing this was by talking about the blessing of canon in the First World War. And the reason is this. Um, I, I heard a lot of my gay friends say, rather polemically, in order to score a debating point, well, you know, the church blesses cats and dogs. It, it, it blesses ships. It's even blessed canons in the First World War. You know, can't it bless love? surely it can stretch itself to move from canons to love and at first sight that sounds like a very good argument yeah it must 
you know, if you can bless a cannon that kills people, can you not bless a, a relationship where people care for each other? But the fact is that in the First World War, the blessing of cannons was done for a series of reasons that appear to be Christian. Nobility, self-sacrifice, love of nation, doing a duty, um, uh, believing in something beyond yourself, uh, good versus evil. But actually, the First World War was fought for a series of very nasty reasons. Ultranationalism, economic greed, hatred of, your, of, of the European neighbour. And it was a complete disaster because all the Christian princes and nations fell upon each other and so destroyed each other that the people found it difficult to believe in, in a God who could allow that amount of slaughter. Now, this was justified by the gap between the presenting language of blessing canons and the real language of what was going on. And therefore, if you ever have that gap, you've got a problem. And my concern is that the gap between what the gay couples are asking for in terms of their blessing and what they actually represent in terms of Christian value and ethics is very large and will have the same effect on demoralizing Christendom as the First World, as, as what happened when the gap led to the First World War. In other words, the relational anarchy that what that, that, that gay coupledom starts off and soon moving, of course, to uh, an enormous changeover in partners and then and then polygamy and polyamory and the sexualization of children we've seen is so dangerous to Christendom and yet it's being presented to the German bishops in terms of well love is love can you not bless love is not the as George Betting said if someone comes to you and they say there's something good in our relationship are you so dull that you can't see it's good and bless it but the wool's being pulled over their eyes and I can only think it's because of the whole, the propaganda that, that our generation has lived through. But actually, we have to pray for a renewal of Christian vision, a renewal of the hunger of holiness, and a renewal of discernment to be able to tell a presenting good from a real good. And at the moment, the German Catholic Church and its bishops seem unable to do that. Mark, perhaps you could um, tell us what it is they mean by blessing and maybe talk about invocatory and constituent blessings. And, and what it is that they that they voted in favour of, and what's expected. I don't think I can. <laughs> <laughs> um, Good, because I couldn't. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, yeah, perhaps you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, so so this so so Gavin's drawn attention to the fact that as Catholics we bless rosary beads and we bless that. Well, you spoke about canons. And perhaps that's a different. We'll leave that to one side. But what what's actually happening in a blessing? And why is it not, why is the church not permitted to bless same sex relationships and never will be? Which is why this is a, causing a potential schism. Well, I suppose fundamentally, it's because we're back on this thing again, aren't we? We keep getting. Okay. <laughs> and it's kind of like, I suppose, because it's what's going on in the church. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you read the document there, it's just, if you read the document they've promulgated, have you read it? It's absolute barking, and I, I can't help but feel that it's like they've they they've lost interest in what the church teaches, and instead they've adopted, uh, you know, secular morale. Like they're they're just doing what, what they say in in the document. They're saying science, or but that, they're they're leaving out huge swaths of the scientific evidence they're leaving out uh, any sort of idea of you know what happens to people who aren't happy when they're assigned a different gender afterwards or you know and they're very subjectively quoting things like they're quoting Pope Francis in Fratelli Tutti and saying uh, you know we have to reach out and try and be friends with everyone else as justification for what they're doing but they're leaving out you know other things like for example in 2016 he said in a conversation with some with some polish bishops he said today children children are taught in school that everyone can choose his or her sex mm. why are they teaching this because the books are provided by the people and institutes that give you the money these forms of ideological colonization are also supported by influential comfort countries and this is terrible well they don't quote that of german bishops you know, they're just quoting things that they think will... And we see this all the time. It's so frustrating. And it lacks any sort of intellectual integrity. And that really worries me that we, it, we're... Just as the world is becoming more ideological, 
we see the church becoming incredibly partisan and ideological. And people aren't prepared to have good conversations uh, and good disagreements. They're just constantly pushing their own side of the argument. I mean, you could even see it in the way that, um, they, you know, I mean, watching what's been going on in America with the American bishops, who are in basically in open warfare at the moment, and you've got the progressives who are only writing in America or National Catholic Reporter, and then you've got the Orthodox who are writing in First Things and National Catholic Register, and you've got the, it's even like the publications are even divided and ideologically divided. And I, I suppose we've always had that sort of divide, but the National Catholic Register, for example, was actually written to by the US bishops a few years ago and told to drop the name Catholic because it wasn't, it, it, you know, it wasn't Catholic in any way, shape or form. I, you know, would, how, how do we get out of this spiral? It just feels like we're in a spiral, doesn't it? With it all? Unless the Pope stands up and tells them well, to... I think one of the ways we get out of this... I think there's a one bit of, the ways of a delay we get out there. Of this... <laughs> There is. I'm so sorry. We're talking across each other. 30 seconds from me. One of the ways we get out of this spiral is doing what we're doing. One, you know, part of the reason the rationale for Catholic Unscripted is that we want as three lay people to say this is this is the magisterium, this is the faith we've inherited. Uh, and we are sufficiently engaged and experienced to be able to stand up and articulate it. And if for any reason that our bishops can't, some reasons that may be good, uh People have been saying that the ordinariat is trying to escape the gaze of Mordor and doesn't want to draw attention to itself in case something happens to it. Um, uh, it doesn't matter whether it's good or bad. Uh, there are there are others, uh, we amongst them, who are willing to articulate what the faith is, and that's why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah, the 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 problem here is is re, is the redefinition of marriage. The problem with blessing and asking the church to bless gay couples is that you it's this idea of setting something aside as sacred to be used for sacred purposes you, uh, the, the church cannot bless a gay relationship set it aside as holy to be you to, to for that relationship to be holy because the sexual acts between man and man woman and woman are not holy so they cannot be or you might bless uh to help you accomplish some activity again i mean lay people will say blessings bless other people and a bless over their food but this isn't the blessing that they're asking for they're asking the church to be involved in that blessing to set to set that relationship apart as holy that's what they're asking that's what that would entail and the church simply cannot do it it never will be able to it doesn't have permission to it cannot change and so this pressure coming to bear will get nowhere and all that's really required is and i think pope francis has um already made this clear might be a bit strong but but <laughs> but has said this you know that, that basically they're heading towards schism um it's not going to change it doesn't matter how many people vote for it how many bishops vote for it the church will never be able to bless gay relationships um but so this book by the way anyone interested is very very good it's what is marriage there we go by Man and Woman, a Defence by Sheriff Gerges and Ryan Anderson. And it says here, th now, now this isn't necessarily looking at religious, religious objections, but it says our essential claims may be put succinctly. There's a distinct form of personal union and corresponding way of life, historically called marriage, whose basic features do not depend on the preferences of individuals or cultures. Marriage is, of its essence, a comprehensive union, a union of will by consent and body by sexual union, inherently ordered to procreation and thus the broad sharing of family life and calling for permanent and exclusive commitment, whatever the spouse's preferences. It has long been and remains a personal and social reality, sought and prized by individuals, couples and whole societies, but it is also a moral reality, a human good with an objective structure which it is inherently good for us to live out. Marriages have always been the main and most effective means of rearing healthy, happy and well-integrated children. It goes on and, and finishes here. Redefining marriage in the public mind bodes ill for the common good. Indeed, societies mindful of this fact need deprive no same-sex attracted people of practical goods, social equality or personal fulfilment. It's not that the church is saying people in same-sex 
relationships can carry on and do whatever they do, which they do, and may want to leave property to one another. The civil laws are a separate matter, but the church cannot bless uh, relationships, set them apart. When marriage means something that cannot be redefined, it means something that gay relationships cannot fulfil. It's as simple as that. But it's an abandonment of the natural law, isn't it? And I think it's important that when we when we talk about natural law, we're not talking about the law of nature. We're talking about the, like the obvious order of the universe. Um, there's no getting away from the fact that children come from one man and one woman. And the fact that we're even considering this or talking about it in this day and age is quite shocking, really, isn't it? And it worries me for the future of um, society, really. Yeah. Yeah, it really worries me too. Gavin, does it worry you? <laughs> <laughs> it does worry me. I've been trying to think of, an, of, a, of a concise way of explaining what I think is a bigger issue, the principle behind this. Um, there was a very, very funny takedown, you know, pro-gay takedown of the Old Testament um, and uh, in mocking mocking the fact that there was slavery and that polyester shirts are a breaking of the law and that there are, there are so many ways in which our present society breaks the cultic and ceremonial and ritual and dietary laws of the Old Testament. You know, why, why have Christians taking this one thing and making a stand about it? Um, and... So we could answer that, but but there's a broader question, which is the training of the Old Testament uh, was in the distinguishing between holy and unholy, between sacred and profane. And it wasn't at all clear why God should say these things are holy and these things aren't. There's some common sense things like you're not to marry women of foreign tribes. And it was explained because actually um, they'll influence you to go and follow their gods and you'll bring up your children following false gods. So, you know, don't do it. It's an unholy thing to do it. And there were some very severe consequences from time to time when people did do it. But the whole of the Old Testament, both in terms of, of, of sex and diet and agriculture, was a distinction between the two ways of doing things, one holy and one profane. And, and it underlay something that, that, that becomes more clear as Christians, which is our capacity to distinguish between good and evil. So you might say holy and profane stand for the difference between good and evil. And the great damage with inclusion and relativity is that it robs the whole church of any sense of this need to distinguish and the capacity to distinguish, which Jesus shows is at the heart of his mission in Matthew 25. There will come a day when all the nations are brought before me and I will separate the sheep from the goats. The, the, great, the, the great moment in the last judgment will be this precisely this separation, but incarnated in human life and human moral choices. For us to give the sense that just because it's sex and emotion and romance, there is no longer any need to make a distinction between good and evil, between holy and unholy, is a betrayal of everything that the gospel is about, everything that Jesus came to do, which is to save us from evil. And, and perhaps this greatest gift of the Holy Spirit after love, which is the capacity to tell a difference between good and evil. It's a gift I've been praying for for the whole of my life, and I'm very bad at it. But I know that the whole church is very bad at it. Um, the, the, the discernment of spirits, uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola was, was extremely keen on uh, in using his exercises, putting the discernment of spirits right at the heart of the whole process of Christian renewal. That's what's abandoned when you when you stop making the distinctions that both the old New Te the Old Testament in practice and the New Testament in principle invite us to live out uh, and and doing what you have to do if you if you decide that that, that same-sex relationships are no different in, in ontology and quality from straight ones and that is produce a relativistic worldview where there isn't where you stop bothering to tell the difference between good and evil mm. well i think that's, gay that's, i'm really struggling go on i was going to say i'm really struggling to articulate that uh it's not about faith you know the, yeah. Like what, sort of what you're saying there is really important and it's not about you know it doesn't mean that we don't like you know gay people exist get over it sort of thing yeah, yeah fine we do but the quality of that relationship the quality of the relationship between two men and two women it's a different thing 
And I'm not saying that they don't love each other. Or like before we get into that, that's not really what I'm trying to say. But it's like a man and a woman coming together to have children and raise a family. That is a unique and special and uh, amazing thing. And it's a different thing. It's just a different yeah. thing, isn't and, it? And, and okay, just, just for the purpose of clarification, everything I've said applies to straight people living together outside marriage. Yeah. Yeah. It's not it's not just same sex. Mm. It's the fact that it's marriage and, and marriage becomes this, as, as Catherine, well, she defined it earlier, it doesn't need repeating. And mm. so the real problem in our society is not with gay people. It's actually with straight people who decline to commit themselves to each other for life, decline to give their parents the stability of, of two parents, decline to put fidelity before comfort and convenience. All the gay people have done is to learn from this and to say, well, can we can we have a bit of be cut a bit of slack as well? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in, in terms of the accusation of homophobia, the 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 campaign has concentrated on gay people. We're not being attacked by secularists over people living together in sin. Otherwise, we'd be fighting in the battle there. We happen to be attacked by on the on the issue of gay marriage. So that's why we're fighting the battle. Mm -hmm. It's not homophobia. We do exactly the same thing when it comes down to heterosexual patterns of indiscriminate sexual amorousness that leads to the having of children outside stable, committed, lifelong relationships. Yeah, yeah I think I, that's... I found that in a face-to-face -face discussion about it, that's quite disarming if you can say to someone, well, yeah, I think gay sex is, is a sin, but I also think masturbation is a sin or fornication is a sin. You know, like any activity outside of the procreative, that, that's sinful because that's sort of what we believe. And it doesn't mean that we're perfect, <clears throat> but it means that we're aspiring to something holy. Um, the the oh goodness i've forgotten wait 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 it'll come back the oh it's gone i hate this right alzheimer's cracks in catherine you go <laughs> wait wait it was um no it's gone completely oh yes no i got it i got it so the very people who say to us is is sex outside of marriage or is homosexual sex a sin us, inviting us to dig a, a hole into which we throw ourselves by being condemnatory. If you were to say to them in debate or questioning, well, do you believe in the concept of sin? In other words, do you believe in there's a holy God who distinguishes between between uh, sacred and profane? They'll say, no, we don't. In which case, well, don't ask us to pronounce on a category that you don't believe in. It doesn't matter. You know, you're just trying to trap us. So, of course, we shouldn't use the language of sin to people who don't believe in sin. It's just an attempt to make to get us to make fool of ourselves and and to appear to be condemnatory i think we have to say to uh, people who ask us that question tell us how you manage your own hierarchy of ethical values and then in that hierarchy perhaps we can place the thing that we're talking about to see where it where it fits i mean for example at the top of the hierarchy might be the welfare of children in which case depriving children of fathers and having multiple partners isn't good for children that's what we Christians mean by sin, but you've probably got another word for it, like um, uh, like disorder or chaos or anarchy or, 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 or screwed up children. Whatever word you like, but don't force us to use the word sin. We'll use your word instead, or perhaps that way we can convince you there's some reality in our, in, in, in our ethical hierarchical values. Yeah, I think that's the thing is to get that dialogue down to the natural law, because it, you because we're all human at the end of the day. And what Mark was saying about feelings is we, we have to try and enter into a rational and reasonable conversation with people about what marriage actually is um, and, and say, well, what logically follows if we say it's just about feelings? I think I want to say it's our passion for trying to create vision. That doesn't mean we, we consider ourselves successful practitioners uh, we're all of us flawed and in fact sometimes it's the flawed people who are most passionate about the vision because we realize that without the vision we really are sunk um, left to our own frailties and, and temptations and fallibilities so this to, to have a passion for the vision is not by implication to say that we are the people who can deliver the vision and know how to do it on the contrary sometimes a the, the relationship between our passion and the vision is precisely the gap we feel between aspiration and performance. So we're not telling people we're better than them. We're saying we've 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 seen the way to go. It's a very narrow road and the cliff is steep either side. 
try and keep the narrow road because people fall off the cliff and get damaged it's it, it, it but it's a very difficult it's very difficult to articulate the vision without appearing to be holier than thou yeah in a way that we're not yeah i mean and i am a stepmother and i love my stepchildren very much and, I, and we have a good relationship and things are as good as they could be but they are nonetheless there is damage there is damage along the way where broken relationships and broken families there's no getting away from that and so uh, quite rightly gavin there's no sense in which we're speaking from this place of we do everything right and you know you guys need to as well it's it's recognizing the reality of how things are recognizing the hurt and the pain and saying you know we've lived it as well but we see that then assenting to these truths is really the only way to bring that healing and why is it the only way because god's the creator of life the author of life who knows best what's best for us than god it's not a group it's not a committee uh, sitting around because because a lot of things appear on the face of it these apparent goods that you talked about the difference between real and apparent goods there are many things that appear to be good we can all say that just recently there was a uh, new there's all there's quite often news stories about the contraceptive pill we're 50 years down from that and we know mm -hmm. the reality of the effects of the pill and they were not expected they're unexpected. It was expected that all these wonderful things would happen as a result of the pill. We're now seeing the degradation of society, the 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 use of women as objects, um, not to mention as a separate aside the the, the health impacts uh, on on both the, on our bodies and also the impact on the environment. But the church, of course, because it's the church and it's it's it, which Christ established, prophesied that these would be the effects of the contraceptive pill, and indeed they are. So it may not seem obvious to us, but as Catholics, we can say we trust the church that Christ um, instituted, that, that Christ's body, uh, who is the head of the church. We trust it, which is also why it can't be changed on a whim in the world that we live in, which will be a different world in 50 years and was a different world 50 years ago. And the church is that rock that we turn to. We Do ask I... it to change us. We don't change it. I really like that. Only this week in the newspaper, I've been reading about the new studies that have talked about the prevalence of breast cancer amongst women who've taken the pill. Mm. Uh, and and uh, I certainly thought when I was a Protestant that the Pope and the whole Catholic Church was dreadfully mistaken over, over its opposition to contraception. But when you when you look at the, the levels of the female hormone that have been pissed into the waters that make our fish infertile and perhaps affect, perhaps affect the testosterone levels of men, it's so, so, so great is the toxicity of it. To say nothing of the cancers, to say, to say nothing of the removal of, uh, of the consequences of mm. sexual behaviour. It's now perfectly obvious 50 or 60 years later that there was an enormous problem with the pill. Um, and and you know, as you say, the church said the cat. This category is wrong. Out of this mistaken category, good will not come. And we're saying the same thing about mm -hmm. same-sex marriage. Yeah, and of course, th the reason women shouldn't take the pill isn't because you want to avoid breast cancer, although it does look like it's causing breast cancer, and it isn't because of the water, although that's terrible. It, it's these are effects, but the 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 problem is that it's about how it how it causes us to look at one another uh, how it causes us to see one another as objects of use and not objects of love and so those other things are important but they're not the reason why we shouldn't use contraception but then we're moving into contraception which is another huge topic so perhaps for this evening we'll wrap it up there mark what do you think i agree with that <laughs> <laughs> i think it's interesting that how like uh, I think it was in Boris in his interview with Boris that uh, that Calvin brought it back to that, where he's obviously coming from an Anglican perspective, but he um, agrees with the fact that, um, that the, the whole breakdown came from the acceptance. All the Christian churches all um, were against contraception, and then there was that breakthrough at the Lambeth Con Conference in yeah. 1936 or something, wasn't it? And, um, yeah, and that and that's like the the watershed moment, wasn't it? Where everything's fallen apart from there, and I mean, it makes perfect sense if you're going to say that if you're going to you know separate the the two the procreative and the unity ends and say you know that uh, sex is just as it's equally important for jollies as it is for anything else. Well, then how do you? What do you think? As soon as you yeah. take away the procreation, then you know. But the fact of the matter is, 
the consequence of sexual intercourse between a man and a woman is children. Yeah. You know, that is its function, its purpose, and that's what it does. That's what happens that's when what you have it, sex people, just yeah, in case you weren't sure. In case you're wondering yeah. what's doing it. <laughs> How did this happen? Yeah. Yeah. No, so. No, it's true. It's absolutely true. I heard someone once say, and I th and I thought at the time they're quite right, and I've thought it ever since, that if you can get young people to see th why contracep artificial contraception is wrong, why contraception is wrong, then everything else will fall into place. They will understand why marriage must be between a man and a woman, uh, lifelong, exclusive. Um, and the, uh, I think that's quite true. And actually, I've seen it happen. I've seen young people the ball you know the, the the penny drops and they say i get it i get i get contraception and then other things follow so absolutely it, it should go back to that and that needs to be addressed yeah well i kind of feel there's a real platonic theme to our whole discussion here but uh, like go it continuing that platonic theme in this vein i would say that that's one of the most beautiful things about being a parent and being a catechist isn't it it's holding up that ideal and saying look this is what we're aiming for the good the true and the beautiful and yeah. uh you know why shouldn't we want integrity why shouldn't we want honor why shouldn't we want uh young men to cherish and respect young women and you know that's what we should be aiming for i think i think you're right and I, and I i don't want you to go even though i said i've got to be quick tonight because you have just reminded me of the most beautiful i mean i could read this whole book but the most beautiful little short um say where you are everyone <laughs> don't go anywhere uh um uh, passage from from peter kreeft and it's called why you're here gavin say something say something intelligent gavin. come on gavin <laughs> look, well, while you while you look it up you mean exactly yeah, right. yeah get on yes get okay on. well for, i want to say that peter kreeft is absolutely brilliant and i'm just hugely impressed and whenever Whenever you point us to salient things that he said, um, both my, my mind is clearer and my heart is fuller. Have you found it yet? Catherine? No, you're doing a really good job, though. So is it in the letters, I won't. Is it oh, letters it's... before I go or whatever it is? Yeah, do you know, it's one of those things I always see. And then when you try and find... Oh, here it is. Oh, I've got to read it. Sorry to Brilliant. test your patience, everyone. But this is so beautiful. Listen to this. It's called Why You Exist. <clears throat> By you here, I don't mean six or seven billion human beings, but you, my four absolutely unique individual children. I think you should know why you exist. I'd be a robber if I didn't give you that information. You exist because your mother and I said yes to God many years ago. We said to God, be God, do your thing, create, give yourself the children you want. We want them too. Use us as your instruments. We will not block your way. And when we said that to God, God said to us, I will create them and you will procreate them. I will love them into existence and I will use your two lovings to do that. I will make a John, a Jenny, a Catherine and an Elizabeth. I and I will also make two others whom I will take straight to heaven before they can be born into your world. So that you will, so that you will indeed have the six children you dreamed of and asked me for, but in a better way than you had thought. But you will not and cannot see how my way was better than yours. As long as you are in the land of shadows, you just have to trust me. Whatever children you have, do to them what I do to you. Tell them why they exist. It's because you let God have his way. Because whenever we do that, great things happen like you. Beautiful. Just beautiful, just beautiful isn't it? I was choking up a bit there. Right, it's just so beautiful. Yeah, so the church is right. In fact, don't bother with unscripted. The church is right. It's all in there. <laughs> you don't need us. <laughs> okay. Should we call it a day? Yeah, why not? Okay. All right. Well, thank you for watching and listening. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. I'm Gavin Ashenden. Holy Week next week. God bless you. Happy Easter when it comes, in case we can't get one up before then. <laughs>